Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the blood that you shed on the cross. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us, that in you we can have life, an abundant life. Thank you for the power of your blood, the goodness of your grace, the healing, the deliverance, the salvation that we have in you. Lord, thank you that we have all of this. We love you. We put our lives in your hands. We put our trust in you. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you that you are here with us. We love you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 What a great time in worship this afternoon. Thank you, guys. All right. How's everybody doing? You guys having a good time in the presence of God? They're at your home, in your small groups, with your family, with your friends. Maybe you're just by yourself in your room. I hope that you've been feeling the presence of God, that you've been lifting your hands in worship. You've been getting into the presence of God with us. And uh, yeah, we're just going to continue in the Word of God right now. And what we're going to do before we get into our message for today, our I just want to remind you of a couple of things. During this time when we have, when we're not able to meet together as a church, we want to encourage everybody to meet together in small groups. You know, they talk about keeping distant from each other and making sure you're not coughing or sneezing on each other and, uh, you know, not spreading germs and all that sort of stuff. But we can still get together in small groups. It's still good to meet together, to worship to pray together. Maybe we can't meet together as a church in a big setting. Honestly, I miss that. I miss coming to church and just worshiping in the presence of God with all of our friends and our church family. But during this time, let's do what's smart, let's do what we need to do, but still meet together. If you guys don't have a small group, we really want to encourage you. Find out where your closest small group is meeting Maybe it's with your friends. You want to go to your friend's place and meet together. That's fine. You guys can do that. Maybe there's another small group that, that meets closer to your house. That's fine, too. But what we'd encourage you to do is contact our office. Our church offices are open, and uh, we want to make sure that everybody's connected. Everybody has somebody that they can meet together with, and that they can um, get, receive encouragement during this time together. And uh, we know that our small groups are a great way to do that, to have community. Even though we can't have a great big group of people, we can get together in small groups in houses and stuff too. too. Uh, also, if you guys are watching online and you have any prayer requests, we would encourage you guys that you would let us know what those prayer requests are. Just send us like a personal message. Uh, send a message to New Life Fellowship uh, we always have our pastors. We have several different pastors who receive those messages. And if you need to talk to somebody, we will, we will set some, something up where you can chat with somebody. Uh, if you need specific prayer about something, let us know uh, because we still want to stay connected. And there's power in prayer. Even though we can't be right close together all the time, prayer is still powerful. And we can pray and we can see God move miraculously uh, through prayer. Also, uh, for all of you guys who uh, want to give your tithes and offerings to the Lord, uh, we have uh, ways of doing that online as well. And uh, there's more information on our, um, on our Facebook page, on our website. We also, if you need to uh, talk to somebody in the office for more details about that, uh, that's available as well. You can give your offering online, you give your tithes online at ABA, Akleda, Cambodia Public Bank, or we also, uh, you can drop it off at our church office uh, on working days as well. Those are just a few of the 
things that we just want to remind you guys about, just about continuing in community uh, during this time when we can't meet together in a big group. We're going to go into our lesson. We're going to go into our message today. Uh, we're going to continue on in our series about the Ten Commandments. And each command, as you guys remember, each command has a principle. The principle that we're going to look at today is the principle of trust. Okay, so I just want to put that out there right from the beginning. It's the principle of trust. Uh, because it is based on a certain command, but the principle of trust kind of runs through all of the commands that are given as well. So... Let's look at the first seven. We're doing the eighth command today, which is, you shall not steal. But the first seven that, we're, that we've talked about, uh, number one is the principle of priority. Uh, the second one is the principle of purity. The third is the principle of humility. The next one, the fourth one, is the principle of rest. The fifth one is the principle of honor. The sixth is the principle of love. And the seventh is the principle of intimacy. And today we're talking about the principle of trust. Now, when you think about trust, a lot of times we think about trust as I am just going to not do anything and then let God do something. And sometimes that's how we think about trust. It's just, I just got to put my mind on God. It's it, the way sometimes that we think about trust is we think of it as very passive, that I'm just going to sit here and let God do what God does and just think the right thoughts in my heart that, yeah, God will take care of me. God will do this and God will do that. But I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge your thinking a little bit that trust is something that is active. Trust is something that, it, that takes action. Trust is not something that we just oh, yeah, okay, I trust God and see what God will do. No, God wants us to trust him, but trust is an action. Think about, think about the, the principle of love. Uh, that's the sixth command that we talked about where it says, you shall not murder, okay? There's a principle of trust in here as well. In that when somebody wrongs you, when somebody does something that you don't like, trust says, I will forgive and I will put this in God's hands. And it's not something where you're just like, okay, yep. No, it's actively choosing to say, God, this is yours. This is yours. I am not going to take I'm not going to take uh, action on this. I'm not going to try to get my own way. I'm not going to try to get revenge when somebody does me wrong. But it's, I'm going to forgive. And trusting in, in the, the, trusting when somebody does wrong to you says, I am not going to do what my heart, my soul, and my all of me wants to do, but I'm going to say, God, this is yours. And trust says many times over and over again, it says, okay, God, I trust you. And sometimes you got to say it again. I trust you, God. And then again, I trust you, God. And saying no to yourself, no to the flesh that wants revenge and saying, no, this is God's, I trust. And a lot of these commands are principles where we're, we're saying, God, this is yours. It's not mine, it's yours. And so, God, I trust you with that. And the, the, what we're looking at today is the eighth command that says, you shall not steal. And why specifically is this the principle of trust? Because when we steal something, it's saying to God, what you have given me is not enough. What you have given me is not enough. So I need to get more, and I need to get more by myself. I need to take from somebody, and I need to get it myself. And that's why this principle, do not steal, is a principle of trusting God. It's a principle of trusting God. Stealing shows something about your heart. 
it shows, number one, it shows selfishness. Yeah, I want this, and I'm going to do whatever I can to get it. But it also shows that you don't trust. There's only one reason why somebody would steal, and that's because you don't trust God to provide that thing for you. I need to get it myself. And that's what stealing shows. Listen to this verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 28. This is going to be the main verse that we use uh, throughout our message today. Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 28. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now listen to what this says. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him work, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So there's three points in that last verse, in, in, in verse 28. It says, let the thief no longer steal, so the thief's got to stop stealing. Number two, let him work. And number three, let him work so that he can have something to be generous, that he can give to other people. So those are our three points for today. Number one, stop stealing. Number two, start working. And number three, start giving, being generous. And this, all three of these points are the principle of trust. Okay? Let's look. I want to show you guys something. I want to look at something together. In Exodus chapter 26, we're going to look at some principles of stealing. Okay, so our first point is don't steal. And we're going to look at a story in the Bible and some commands that Moses gave to the children of Israel while they were walking around in, in, in the wilderness. And these are some commands regarding manna. Now, manna was the bread that came from heaven every single day to the Israelites. Okay, it was miraculous bread every single day. Uh, on, well, actually, it was six days, and then on the seventh day, there was no manna because it was a Sabbath. They, God told them not to go out and get any. But listen to what God says in these verses. Okay, so they were out all in the wilderness. There's probably at least two million of them. Uh, two, million, two million of the Israelites wandering around. And God says, I'm going to provide food for you. And this manna started coming each and every day. But then listen to what, uh, what, what happened here. Okay? When the people of Israel saw the manna, they said to one another, What is it? For they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread that God has given you to eat. And this is God's command. Gather the manna, each one of you, as much as you can eat. So God says, go out, go, collect as much manna as you can eat. So everybody, all two million of them went out in the morning, getting all this manna, putting it in their basket, taking it back to their tent. You shall each take an omer. Okay, so there was a certain amount. We don't know exactly how much it was, but there was a certain amount for each person. According to the number of the persons that each of you has in your tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they got to the tent and they measured it, each person had one omer. Okay? Whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. So this is God's, you know, great provision. Send the kids out. They get a little bit. When they add it all up in their tents, each person gets one omer. And uh, like I said, we don't know exactly what an omer is. You know, a basket of some sort. Um, but each person had the same amount. And so then God says, all right, you go and you get, but don't save it until the morning, okay? Because next morning you're going to go out and you're going to get some more. And so then each and every day they go out, six days a week. They go get the manna, come back in, eat the food. Every, every single day they get the same amount. So Moses said to them, don't let anybody leave it over until the morning. But the Israelites didn't listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and in the morning, 
It stunk and was filled with worms. And Moses was angry with them. So, what does this have to do with stealing? Well, number one, they didn't trust God. Think about a guy, one of the Israelites. He's like, all right, I got this omer. I got this basket full of manna. And God said for me to eat it all in one day. It was enough for, me, for one day. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to save a little bit. I'm going to save a little bit, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep it until tomorrow. So he does that, but really what happens is that he, he steals from himself because he doesn't get the full sustenance of that whole basket of, of, of manna. So he keeps some of it, doesn't eat of it, goes hungry because he's not eating all the, on the first day, but then he go, leaves it till the next day, and it's wasted. So he's, he's got this, he, he takes from the first day, keeps it till the second day, but the second day it's not blessed, it's, it's ruined. And so he's stealing from one day to leave it till the second day, but then it's ruined. Okay? Then the, God says another time, on the sixth day, gather twice as much bread, two omers. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, this is what the Lord has commanded. God, or, or sorry, Moses said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of rest. So you get two omers on the sixth day, one for day six and then one for day seven, so that you don't have to go out on the seventh day. So they laid it aside until the morning, probably expecting that it was going to be spoiled again. But in the morning, it wasn't. It didn't stink. It wasn't full of worms. It was okay. And so on the seventh day, they had enough for that seventh day. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath. Today you will not find any manna in the field. Six days you shall gather it. On the seventh day, there will be none. But, once again, the Israelites did not trust God. Some of them went out on the seventh day to find some more manna, and there wasn't any there. And so we see that in this example, the Israelites weren't trusting God. They weren't trusting his provision. They were going out to take more than what God had given to them. Okay? And so they were, they were going against the provision of God. They were saying, God, what you give me isn't enough. I need more. And so they were going out to grab more, take more, take more, take more. But God says, no, I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. Think about other uh, stories in the Bible. Think about Achan. Achan was the guy who took some gold and silver from Jericho and a nice robe from Jericho and hid it in his tent. God said to the Israelites, you go in, the first city that you take, the first city that you destroy, belongs to me. This is the principle of the first fruits. Don't take any of the plunder. Don't take any gold. Don't take any silver. Don't take any of the nice things that you see in the ruins of Jericho after it's destroyed. Because it's mine. It belongs to me. So, that was God's command to Joshua and the Israelites before they went and conquered Jericho. Then they walked around for six days. On the seventh day, they went around a bunch of times. And then the walls fall down. They go in and conquer. But God said, don't take any of it. Don't even touch it. But Achan, he said, no, I want this. I want this. And so he took gold, took silver, took some nice robes, buried them in his tent. And then they went out to fight the next city, the city of Ai, just this tiny little city, they should have beaten them no problem. But then they were defeated by Ai. And Joshua was like, well, what's going on? And then God said, someone broke my command. Someone took what belongs to me. And then they figure it out, it's Achan. And uh, he confesses and brings it all to Joshua. But what we see in that story is that the things that were devoted to God became a curse when Achan took it for himself. And if there's things that we need to give to God, we need to devote to God, things that are really God's, 
but we take it for ourselves, it's not going to be a blessing for us. It's going to end up being a curse like that was to, to Achan. And so we need to be careful that we are always honoring God and always trusting God. What are some ways, you know, maybe you don't go out and, you know, run to the market and steal this or steal that or take this or take that or, you know, take money from your, your friend's wallet or anything. Maybe you don't do any of that stuff, but there could be other ways that we take advantage of things, kind of cut corners here and there in order to steal. We do this to get our own advantage, do this to get ahead a little bit. I want to encourage all of us, myself included, let's commit to being truthful in all of our finances. Could be saying, doing things like making sure we pay our taxes honestly. Okay? Even Jesus paid taxes. Okay? It's not like we're in some competition with the government. How can I hide my money from the government? No. Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God's. He says, no, we have to pay our taxes. Submit to the to leaders. So if we're cutting corners or lying about our income or doing this or that and not paying our taxes, then we're stealing. Okay? Don't take advantage of people. Okay? Don't take advantage of anyone. All right? Taking bribes or asking for bribes. That would be considered stealing because you're asking for more and you're not trusting God. Giving the wrong change or keeping a little bit for yourself is stealing. You know, sometimes your boss sends you with some money and you go and get it exchanged and you know that there's a little bit of uh, extra money with the exchange money. Stealing would be putting that extra money in your pocket and saying, oh, they'll never know because I'll just tell them that it was this exchange rate and not this exchange rate. That's stealing. That's not being truthful. That's not being honest. Do you think God is going to bless that tiny little bit of extra money that you took from somebody? No, it's going to be like what Achan took. It's going to be, end up being cursed. We need to be truthful and trust God with all of our finances. God is a good God to us. We always need to remember that. God is good to us. He's our Father. He's our Heavenly Father. He loves us and cares for us, and he'll take care of us. We don't have to cut corners. We don't have to do this for ourselves or steal this from them. Or No, let's trust God. So the first point, stop stealing. Second point, start working. Start working. Ephesians 4.28, we read that already. It says, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. God expects all of us to work and to work hard. To be an example to those around us. Not to be lazy, not to cut corners, not to just, oh yeah, I'll just kind of show up for work and, you know, play on my phone a little bit here and there and uh, get my paycheck at the end of the month. No, let's be hard workers Let's honor God by working hard. Let's honor God by working hard. If you want to trust God, stop stealing and start working. Start working, work hard. <clears throat> the third point would be to get giving. Start giving. You know, God doesn't give us things just for our own benefit. Especially during these times when, you know, we're not sure, we're uncertain about the future. We don't know, you know, if we might get locked in our houses. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's be people who are generous. Let's be people who are helpful. Let's be a light that shines. Rather than thinking about, oh, I have to take care of myself and protect and to take care of this. And even when we are protecting ourselves... That's not trusting God either. God can protect all that you have way better than you can protect yourself. Sometimes it takes trust. I would say most of the time it takes trust in order to be generous because you're giving more than you have 
But you're also saying, okay, God, this is my extra. I'm going to use it to be a blessing to other people. But, you know, but I also have to trust you with that as well. Because my temptation is to keep it for myself, to hoard it for myself, to protect it for myself. But God wants us to be people who are generous. Just like God said to Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. Okay? The blessing isn't just for us to keep it for ourselves and say, hey, look at me, I'm blessed. No, God says, all right, I've given you something. I've blessed you. Don't worry about trying to get more for yourself. Don't worry about protecting what you have, but be a blessing and be generous with what you have. God wants us to be people who are generous. God also wants us to be people who give and give him what is rightfully his as well. One of the verses that we use a lot when we're talking about tithes and offerings is Malachi chapter 3. And it says, well, let me read it. I'll look it up real quick and uh, let's just go ahead and read it together. Okay. Malachi chapter 3 verse 10. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test. And see if I will, will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing. And then listen to this, what God says. I will rebuke the devourer so that it will not destroy the fruit of your soil, and the vine in the field shall not fa fail to bear. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. When we give, God protects what we have. We give God the first fruits. We give God the tithe, the first 10%. And he says, I'm going to rebuke the devourer. There's a devourer out there. But if you do this, I'm going to protect you. So if you want to Want your finances to be protected? Give to God. This is what God says. But listen to what a couple of verses before that says. It says, From the days of your fathers, this is God talking again, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept to them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? But you are robbing me. You say, how did we rob you? In your tithes and in your contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. And then he goes on to say, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. So when we give, when we give our tithes and of our offerings, God says, look at, you're cursed because you're not giving. Okay? You don't trust me enough to give. So you're under a curse. Because you're robbing from God. You know, we're talking about do not steal. It's not just talking about do not steal from others. It's don't steal from God. How are you stealing from God? By not bringing the tithes and the offerings. So God says, stop robbing me. Robbing from me. Bring the full tithes. And you will stop being under a curse. When you... When you give, when you give tithes and offerings, it actually flips it around so you're no longer under a curse, but God protects you. We give that 10%, God will protect the 90%. How many of you guys have ever had months where you're, you seem like you're just spending, 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 and your money's all gone by like the first week? You don't, even, you don't have enough money for the last three weeks. Well, God says, I'm going to protect you. Bring me the first fruits. Bring me the tenth. And then I'll protect you. God's desire for us is to live a life of trust. And one of the greatest ways that we can do that is in our finances. And we don't, as a, as a child of God, think about this. God is the king of a kingdom. Okay, God's a good God, a good king. He's the king of a kingdom. And we are the people who live in his kingdom. So just imagine a great king and a great kingdom. 
And God is the king who provides for everybody in the kingdom. But then he sees somebody in his kingdom who's starting to lie and steal and cheat. And the king goes up to them and says, Am I not generous enough for you? Don't I give enough already for you? I give you manna every day. I give you all that you need every day. Is that not enough? It's like a slap in the face to the king saying, you're not good enough, king. I need to get it my own way. God wants us to trust him. He's a good king. He gave this command for us to depend on him, for us to learn that God, what you've given me, it's enough. What you've given me is enough. And it's not just enough, but God, you've given me more than enough. So I'm going to be generous. I'm going to be generous to other people. I'm going to be someone who, who trusts you when it's good, when it's bad, when it's difficult. I'm going to trust. Because this is the way that God wants us to show to the world his glory. When we're content, when we're filled with peace in our hearts, when we're not striving and stealing and grabbing and taking, people are like, why? Why don't you do that? And you can say, well, let me tell you about my king. Let me tell you about my king. My king takes care of me. Every day, he gives me exactly what I need. He takes care of the birds in the sky. He takes care of me as well. Oh, you're not worried, you're not stressed, you're not cutting corners, you're not taking extra money from this, you're not hiding that. No, my king's a good king. My king is a good king. He loves me. He takes care of me. He watches out for me. He's generous. And you know what? I'm going to be generous too because I want to be like my king. I want to take care of others. I want to be like my king. Let's all... Make a commitment to be like our king. To trust him and say, you know what? He's got me. I don't have to take. I don't have to grab. I don't have to steal. My king is a good king. And he provides and protects and watches over me. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, King Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you provide for us. Thank you that we don't have to worry or fret or make plans to get ahead or take this or steal or any of that. But God, you take care of us. You're a good, good king. And God, this day, this week, I pray that each one of us would grow in the area of trust in our hearts. We would grow a little bit closer to you and to your heart in the area of trust. Help us to know you more as a good king. Help us to rest in you. Help us to trust you as our Lord, as our provider, as our leader, as our guide. And I just pray for each person out there today who's listening, God, I pray that you would impart to them trust. I know we're going through difficult times, hard times, things we've never seen before. It's hard to, to trust. But God, help us to be led by the knowledge of who you are. The knowledge of who you are as a king, as a provider, as a lord. And help us to be a shining light of a person who trusts you at all times. And it's a trust that is active. It's a trust that says no to the flesh, no to the desires to get ahead, and says, I'm going to trust my God. I'm going to trust you with all of my heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding, but I will acknowledge you as my source at all times. God, I thank you that you are present. I thank you that we can commune with you 
You're not just a, someone who lived in the history books and now we just learn about you in, in the books. No, God, you are here. You're real right now. And you have our, your, you have our lives in your hands. We thank you. We love you. And we honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you guys out there have any prayer requests, I would encourage you. Drop us a personal message. Get in contact with some of our leaders. Our pastoral uh, staff are on hand during all of the online services. We want to chat with you. We want to talk with you. Uh, if you need counseling, need encouragement in any way at all, let us know. Because we want to stay connected. Even if we can't meet face to face, at least we'll be able to stay connected uh, uh, virtually and through social media and that. So God bless you guys. Have a great week and we'll see you guys all next week. Thank you very much.